Welcome to the Widener Wordsmith, a podcast series designed to enhance and supplement legal methods here at Widener University Commonwealth Law School. I am Pam DiMartino, an adjunct professor of legal methods and the host of this series. Joining me throughout this year will be attorneys from both academia and legal practice who will provide listeners with advice and insight into the challenging process of legal writing. Hello, listeners, and thank you for spending part of your day with me. I extend a special welcome to the one owls who were asked to listen to this episode as they develop their arguments in their briefs. The topic of today's podcast is the counter argument, and I have two questions that I will seek to have answered. One is why? The why of a counter argument. Why is it needed for a complete and successful brief? And the other is the how how to go about developing an effective one. To help me answer these questions is Professor David Raker Jordan, who joins me now in the studio. Welcome, Professor. Thank you, Pam. Professor Raker Jordan is an associate professor of legal methods here at uh, Widener Commonwealth Law. Uh, He teaches, I would say, for the most part in the day program, but is also um, involved in certain classes in the evening division as well. I teach wherever the dean tells me to teach. (laughs) Which could be across lines. Could be the day, could be the night, could be late afternoon. Okay. Currently, uh, my guess is that many of my night students may not be as familiar with you as the day students. So what I'm hoping to do before we launch into this discussion of uh, the counterpart or the counter argument and the the why and the how is uh, to give students... uh, just sort of a flavor of who you are and and what your role is here at the law school. And with that, let's start with uh, your title. I I know that uh, from speaking with students that at the very beginning of the year, you invite them to refer to you uh, by something other than your compound last name. (laughs) Well, yes, since my wife also teaches here, and I think most of your students probably have my wife for civil procedure, um, a lot of students will refer, refer to me as DRJ or Professor DRJ, and they'll refer to my wife as Professor SRJ. Students will call me DRJ to my face. They don't usually call my wife SRJ to her face. Nice. She's a little more formal. She gets the, the full title. She gets the full title. Alternatively, they could refer to my wife as Lady Raker Jordan, and they could refer to me as Lord Raker Jordan. Either one. Either one would work, yes. Either one would work. And, and there you are. So now everyone knows um, if they hear these various titles, you are one and the same person. Yes. So when you were in law school um, a couple of years ago, uh, yeah. sitting there thinking about your future, uh, at that time, did you envision yourself growing up and becoming a, a, a law school professor, you know, teaching legal writing? No. No, I never, I never had that thought. The, the first time I ever had any thought about teaching was the law school that I went to third year students were paired up with professors to teach legal writing to first year students. All right. So although we have academic support students here, right. I as a third year student was primarily responsible for teaching the first years. Oh, almost like an externship on or, the job. Or more like educational malpractice. Oh, well, as I look <laughs> depending back on, on how it. you view it, yes. But I really enjoyed that experience. Um, and then we, we moved to, to Harrisburg. My wife was working here at the law school and they had an opportunity for, they needed somebody to teach legal writing. And I thought, well, maybe I can do that. And mm-hmm. so I did it, tried, came in as an adjunct and they slowly turned me into a full-time professor. And you've been here ever since. Been here ever since. That was probably the early 2000s. Okay, so you started out then principally in the legal methods program. Yes. Um, but since then, I've seen your name on a number of different courses. Yes, so I've taught... Uh, several different flavors of academic support. I've taught the ILA class for first year students. I've mm-hmm. taught the ALA course for second year students. I've taught contract drafting, a legal methods three course, nice. taught that several times. And I also, years ago, I would teach the fundamentals of the bar course, course. which we now have outsourced to Barbary, I think. I think Barbary is now coming in and care. offering that. They're taking care of that for us. In a, in a, online in an online course. But let's go back to that. And, you know, in teaching a, a bar preparatory course like that, um, I'm going to assume that you were able to see a direct correlation between the work that we do in Legal Methods 1 and 2 and, and students' performance on the, on the bar exam. Yes. 
I mean, a, a big focus of any kind of writing is thinking about who is your reader and what does your reader need. Uh, and so a big part of at least essay writing in Pennsylvania is knowing what the bar examiners are looking for and right. how you need to tee that up so it's easy for them to find the points so that you can pass the bar right. exam the first time. There's a goal. Yes, <laughs> that is the goal. That is the goal. So now um, I think then we can turn to my two really big questions um, that, that you're going to uh, give us some insight to today, and that is the why and the how of the counter argument. Okay. Uh, the, the specific component of the brief writing um, that our students are working on right now. And, and so in turning first to the question of why, um, let me suggest this. It almost seems counterintuitive to present your opponent's side in, in your argument and your time, giving them any type kind of recognition or, or a, it's almost like an admission that there's another side of the story and, and inviting either you know the court or another party to consider that. So why is it that it's really you know essential that we include a counter argument in our briefs? Well, let me start by saying I would agree with you that you don't want to make your uh, you don't want to make your opponent's argument for them. Right. Um, on the other hand, we do need to anticipate what authority the other side is going to use to make their argument. And so the way I teach counter arguments is we're going to undercut the authority that our opponent's going to use without articulating their argument clearly. Oh, there's a difference. All right, so we'll hold that thought to the how, how we're going to actually do that. Let's consider the why then uh, in terms of, of, of the different approaches then, you know, wh why we can um, need, why we would need to address a particular point that differs from ours. And by that, what I'm referring to are three examples that you present in a handout um, that we're going to refer to as the counter argument handout in the course of this podcast. And I'll let uh, listeners know that you will be able to access a copy of this handout if you have not been uh, given a copy in the course of your legal methods class. Um, it will be uploaded as a link on the podcast description for this particular episode. And in that handout, you identify uh, three reasons, in, in essence, of why you might counter another person's um, position. So I'm going to start with this, the first example, and that would be um, you disagree on the rule to apply. You know, you know okay. in, in the midst of, of the conflict, there is a disagreement on just what role is even in play here. Mm -hmm. Can you give an example of what that might look like? Okay. So that's what I would refer to as a rule battle. All right. So a, a rule battle, the classic example of a rule battle is a jurisdiction takes up an issue. It's an issue of first impression. They've never decided this issue before. So they have to find some law to decide it. Well, if you look to other jurisdictions, maybe jurisdiction A has one law, jurisdiction B has a different law. We have two different laws. All right. One favors the moving party, one favors the responding party. They're going to argue about what law the court should apply. That's a classic kind of rule battle. That's a rule battle. Another one then, we disagree on the interpretation of the rule. <laughs> so interpretation of the rule um, can is sometimes looks like a different rule, but I, I'll talk about in the context of contract drafting. So in contract drafting, a lot of times we'll use, we'll have a list of things and we'll say, you can't do these things, including other things. And so the word including, everybody agrees that the word including is in the statute or it's in the contract or it's in whatever rule we're looking at. All right. But in some contexts, of course, we'll read including as a restrictive word Mm -hmm. mean, including this and nothing else. So including A, B, and C, and the courts will find that, well, it has to be A, B, or C. Other times, courts will read including as non-restrictive, in other words, meaning including but not limited to. So in contract drafting, we're always very careful to be clear in terms of exactly what we mean, because if you just say the word including, there's some courts that will read that to say, oh, well, you're, you're restricted to only what you mentioned. A very narrow interpretation. A very narrow interpretation, whereas others will give it a more expansive and, and say, well, no, including means including but not limited to. 
So it's the same, it could be the same rule, it could be the same phrase, it could be the same contract clause, but it could be interpreted differently by different courts. And without any case examples or, or you know, precedent uh, to, to guide us on. Yes, if you have no, if you have no case examples, it's going to be very difficult to argue one way or the other. Um, case examples would be the best, but I've even seen cases where, and sometimes you'll have different states interpret it differently. It's the same language, but it's interpreted differently in different states. Right, so we would go for uh, persuasive authority. Yes. In that case. Yes. All right. So those are two of the examples that you identify in the handout. It is the third example then um, that I've purposely left last because that is what our focus is going to be today. And that is where we are disagreeing um, with the application of the case examples to a rule that we agree on. Mm -hmm. would, would that be a fair description yes. of, of, of that yeah, type the of The rule is clear. We have a series of case examples. Some favor one party and some favor the other party. And with a counter argument then in that it's under that scenario where, uh, and I'm anticipating an argument where we, you know, we lay out the rule and we're laying out our examples, um, but we know that ultimately we're going to be disagreeing on the application of those case examples. Where in that structure will the counter argument fall? So there's actually two different places where the counter argument could fall. All right. Um, if you have like a series of cases, and if you're able to both analogize to cases and distinguish them in a fairly straightforward way, you may be able to encompass all the cases. If you can use all the cases to support your argument, then I would say in most situations, you don't really need a separately denominated counter argument. All right. Because you've already dealt with all the cases yes. and you're done. A trickier situation occurs where there's a split in the cases where there's a, a number of cases that clearly work for you and you can analogize to. The other cases don't really support you very well. And in fact, they probably support the other side better. Mm -hmm. And so now we're in a situation where we're going to have a more formalized counter argument. And I think that's what you're, that's where we're going right now. That's where we're going right now. And, and primarily because our assignment, um, anticipates that yes um, for the uh, for the brief writing for our students right now yes um, so uh, keeping in mind and and i agree with you wholeheartedly there's more than one way of going about this and and perhaps we should put that caveat out there um you know the, the counter argument can look and feel differently and and be placed in different um places within a brief there's no definitive rule um, I, I think the definitive rule is it should go where it makes the most logical sense and where it will present itself more, most persuasively. Yes. All right. Well, I think then we should all understand why, the why then of, of why do we have a counter? <laughs> what is it that could possibly be rising to the top as, as really uh, the dispute where it might fall within the brief and why we would need to have it there um, to, to begin with. So let's talk about the how. How do we go about um, effectively presenting a, a counter argument? And I, again, I'm going to refer to your handout where you suggest a uh, structure um, for a counter um, beginning with a new paragraph. Kind of the, the assumption would be that you're first going to make your argument. And you're going to make your argument without reference to any of the authority that the other side's going to use. You're going to focus only on the authority that supports your argument, the facts that support your argument, mm -hmm. the case examples that support your argument. You're going to lay your argument out completely. All right. One problem I find a lot of students do is they, they have this ping pong game in their argument where they start off to make an argument and then they immediately think, oh, what's the other side going to say? And they try to respond to that. And then they come back and they say something in response. All right. Focus just on what you're going to argue, and that'll take you through your conclusion, the rule, the case examples, and your application. Once you've done that, now you're ready to start the counter argument. And as you said, so I, my first suggestion would be to start a new paragraph to signal to the reader that we're moving to a different topic. And this topic is going to be the counter argument. Um, you then could either restate your argument. Or you could re, or you could make a statement about why the authority that the other side is going to use, or that you think they're going to use, isn't going to be applicable. So you could say something like, "Although 
such and such a case appears superficially similar to our case, this court should not use it for the following reasons. But the key is going to be, we're going to undercut the authority. We're not going to go after their particular argument. One, because at least for the assignment we're doing here, we don't know what the other side's going to argue. Well, I was going to ask about that. You know, if, when you're the appellant, you don't have the benefit of the appellee's brief. Right. If you're the appellant or if you're the moving party, you don't know what the other side's going to argue. The best you can do is anticipate what their authority is going to be. If you're in a situation where the other side's already filed their argument and you know exactly what their argument is, then you can attack their argument head on. Sure. But again, you would only do that after you made your argument. Even on the responding side, it's it's still critical that you launch yes. your, your, your side first. Okay, so you make uh, a, an interesting point um, where you're, you're carefully laying out the counter argument as not an attack on what their, the other side's position might be. It is more of a challenge to the authority that they might be drawing on to support that position. Yes. Is, is that a fair characterization? Yes. All right, so how do we do that? The first thing is you have to think about, and as you're drafting, you're, you're doing this already. So you're reading cases, you're deciding which cases support you, what are the best cases, the strongest cases that support your position. You should also be thinking, what are the strongest cases that support my opponent's position? Mm -hmm. So we're not gonna deal with every single case Sure. Every single yes. authority that supports our opponent's position, we're going to deal with the strongest ones, which is usually the ones students don't want to deal with because they're the toughest. But that's the most persuasive. If you can deal with their strongest argument, that's going to give the court a lot of confidence that you've taken care of all the problems. You've looked at this problem in a holistic way. You're not trying to hide bad news. Going back to our earlier lessons on persuasive writing, um, it, as I had presented it, it it's an, it, oftentimes an issue of, of your credibility with the court. And so, as you say, bringing in what might be the most damaging authority and squarely addressing it, I think, would increase your credibility with the court. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so um, we're going to select be selective here mm -hmm. on uh, the authority that uh, we, we want to address uh, and that we want to talk about. Um, let me give you an example of what I consider to be a typical example in the student writing that I've seen um, when they're attempting to do this. They will open up their paragraph um, with a sentence. Um, and let's, you know, pretending in a scenario, we'll say it's a criminal case, um, and I'm representing the defendant. So I could open up my paragraph with, you know, the other party argues that, or the state argues that blah, 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 but this is why that argument fails. So in one sentence, I'm going to just summarize their entire brief on mm -hmm. that point and immediately turn around and, and try to counter it, try to, you know, to come back on it. And I, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how much, you know, is that really enough airtime to let the court really understand or appreciate the distinction and the argument that you're trying to make? Well, no. So it's, mm -hmm. it's one, it's not enough airtime. Um, second point is I, I think the, the first thing I noticed was that you were, you were trying to, you were trying to attack their argument. So the other party argues this. Mm -hmm. So you're actually going to articulate their argument. And if you're the moving party who's filing first, you may be giving them ideas about what they could argue that they haven't thought of before. So there's no point in that. Um, again, I think it's better, and as I often tell students, the other side cannot make an argument unless they have authority to back that up. Because I have a lot of students who, like in the statement of facts, will put all kinds of facts in they think might be bad for them, which they should. They should put legally significant facts in, even though those facts hurt them. Right. And I'll say, why did you put this fact in? Well, it helps the other side. I'll say, well, how are, you, how are they going to use that? What law are they going to use with that fact? Well, they don't have any law. Well, then they can't use that. So again, think about what authority are they going to use? So instead of saying the other side is going to argue blah, 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 say something about the case itself. All right. So this case, so this other case stands for this limited proposition or courts have held have held in this particular case that under oh. certain circumstances, they might do something. 
So we completely remove the other party yes. um, from the equation. And, yes. and instead, we're focusing the lens is only on the, uh, the authority. On that, the authority. The, the authority itself. On the authority. So if there's a case example they're going to use, we're going to explain why that case example should not be used by the court in our situation because either our facts are different, mm -hmm. um, the underlying rationale in that case doesn't work here, the policy concerns in that case are not valid policy concerns mm -hmm. in our situation, something else, something other than what the other party might try to argue. Because on the one hand, we probably don't know what they're going to argue. And even if we do know what they argue, if you know what they're going to argue, you could attack their argument directly, or you could just undercut their authority. I think of it as a table is not going to stand unless it has three legs. If you attack one of the legs, if you attack the authority, the table is going to fall. And so then you've already set them up at a great disadvantage before they even have put their their argument, their brief together. Like yes. They have to overcome now what it is that you have pointed out to the court as, as a potentially major weakness in their analysis. Yes. Interesting. Um, then how does that relate to the section in your handout here where you make a, a distinction between the assertive version and a defensive version in the writing of the counter argument? The assertive version starts off with a clear statement of how the case that your opponent is going to use is different, is not similar to our facts. Mm -hmm. What a lot of students want to do, even though they start with the case their opponent is going to use, is they immediately start to talk about how their opponent's case might seem to be similar to our facts, but it's different in this way. So they end up digging themselves a hole. Almost give a concession there. They almost concede <laughs> that, well, yeah, it is similar to our facts, but now let me explain why it's different. The assertive version starts off and says, the case they're trying to use is not like our case, either factually or because of rationale or because of some policy concern. Sorry. So, it ne so you never go down the track of either stating what your opponent's arguing or stating how your opponent is going to try to use that case. You're immediately going to inform the court why that case is different and irrelevant in the resolution of our it dispute. It simply doesn't apply. It yes. just simply doesn't apply the facts here. And, and the and faster you can do that, the more credibility you're going to have with the court. If it takes you a long, long time to explain why the case is different, then it seems like you're protesting too much. <laughs> Well, and, and on that point, then I will suggest that students uh, take a look at the handout because you give a very nice, um, you give very nice examples of each of those versions at play so that you can see what, what does an assertive version look like um, as opposed to the defensive version on the same set of facts and with the same case. Okay. I stole that from somebody else, but I think, I think you're right. I think it does work well, and I think it's really helpful to have concrete examples, and this is... There's some nice concrete examples in the handout. All right. Um, I'm wondering what your feelings are about the questioning of the motives of your uh, opponent. Um, you know, what he or the, she might be thinking or, you know, if it's uh, an institution. Um, let me give you an example. Um, again, let's keep it in terms of a criminal matter and I'm representing the defendant. So what about a statement where I say, the state's reasoning for advancing this argument can only be that it wants to make an example of my client? Well, if I don't want you to directly articulate your opponent's argument, I'm pretty sure I also don't want you to speculate as to why they're making that <laughs> argument. Um, it's just, it's totally unnecessary, it's irrelevant, and it really falls into that kind of emotional appeal that although we use in ordinary arguments a mm -hmm. lot of times, right. we really do not want to use in legal argument. We want to stick to the law and the facts. Um, a little bit of emotional fact can be okay, but trying to paint the other side as the bad guys when, you're, when it's not based on what the law says is a very dangerous road to go down. Uh, and I agree. I was hoping you would give me that point. All right, let's stick with that. Um, this idea of uh, how you address your opponent and how you uh, portray them to the court. Um, there's an educator by the name of Joseph Harris who uh, has published a book widely used in uh, public education um, where he presents a, a discussion on the, on the counter argument 
that, that is to be included within an argument. He calls it countering, and he takes off on this whole idea of how do you counter another person's or another party's position. And he makes the point that, you know, in assessing a situation, we can disagree but remain civil in that disagreement. I can address our disagreement and still be, I can be assertive, I can be an advocate, I can be, you know, even somewhat aggressive, but still retain a level of civility and respect for my opponent. Yes. Um, I'd, I'd like to talk about that point, particularly in the realm of legal writing, where so often the media at least portrays um, you know, being an advocate as mean as being um, someone who's going to be mean and and vindictive and and disrespectful and and I don't believe that's what we're encouraging students to do here in this particular part of their brief. No, no, and I think if you if you focus on the authority, the authority that you're going to use, the authority that your opponent's going to use, and that's where you keep the focus, then you'll be much better able to maintain a civil discourse. Mm -hmm. If you're not, I mean, instead of attacking what their argument is, look at what their authority is. And if you can convince the court that their authority should not be used in this case, their authority does not say what they might want you to think it says, it means what I'm telling you, uh, then they have no argument and you did not have to do anything to attack them personally. And, and I think that's the word, troubles me, is you know, attacking. You know, that, yeah. that we seem to think that's what we have to do to be successful. Yeah, you do not have to attack someone to be an advocate. You're being an advocate for your client. Um, and to the extent that you can explain all the relevant case law, that's what an advocate needs to do. If, there's, if you've not left any case law that the court believes favors the other side, then you're going to win. Our students um, will finish up their brief writing um, beginning to end. Uh, and, and turn the brief in, and at that point, if not before, uh, we'll start to fret uh, about their oral argument, um, because that will be the final endeavor. In what way, though, are they preparing for that oral argument as they draft the brief right now? It's not unusual in oral argument for the court to ask you, your opponent has argued that such and such a case is relevant and should be used to decide this case, why should we not use that case? So the mm -hmm. same approach you're using in writing where you're thinking about authorities the other side's going to use, it's very likely that the court's going to be thinking the same thing, that if the other side is relying on a particular precedent, what's your argument that the court should not use that yeah. precedent? And so even if a case does not make its way into the actual drafting of the counterargument in your brief, the time spent in looking at, at other cases that are available and thinking about your opponent's side as you're drafting will all um, work towards your benefit in the course of the argument. Absolutely. And, and the way we do oral argument is you will exchange briefs with your opponents before oral argument. So you will know what cases they are relying on. So even if in your brief you didn't anticipate they were going to use a particular case, when it comes time for oral argument, you will know what, what authorities they are relying on. So you can be prepared to answer any question about why that authority should or should not be used. Well, Professor, do you have any um, overall advice for our 1Ls then as they work uh, towards completion of their appellate brief and, and ultimately to the oral argument this semester? I would say draft early and revise heavily. Mm -hmm. I see, I just got finished doing conferences with students on their trial memos, and what I saw was a lot of pretty good first drafts. I didn't see a lot of heavy revision, and I think part of it was they didn't have a lot of time to work on it, but mm -hmm. for the appellate brief, I tell my students, draft a particular section or subsection and then move on to something else. Don't try to revise until, you've, until it's gone cold for three, maybe four, at least three or four days. Because if you can come back to it when it's cold, you're much more, it's much, more, much easier to be able to see where the problems are. But when you try to write it in the morning and revise it in the afternoon, you can't do it. All you're thinking about is what you thought it said when you wrote it. You're thinking about the thoughts in your head. You're not reading it the way a brand new reader is going to read it. So draft early, revise often. And, and, and to your point, we know that this appellate brief is going to have a lot of moving parts to it. 
Um, and so I, the, the idea that you can handle all of these parts in a day, right? Uh, you know, all all at once, you're going to you know to sit down and draft. I, I mean, that was has been my experiences. Um, I was reading through the, the, the JOs from last semester, and you know, particular sections were so well done, and then other sections wobbled. Um, and when I went back and, and talked to students, I was shared with them that my perception was too much was left to perhaps at the end, or you know, became compressed, where it became clear where you spent time writing and rewriting and redrafting, and then too much came together at the end because you know you came to realize there are a lot of moving parts yeah. that have to be. Yeah, I mean these these assignments take much longer than you think they're going to take. It's best to get started early, um, break it up in little pieces. It is daunting. This, the whole project is daunting, mm -hmm. but if you break it up in small pieces and do a little bit every day, you can get it done and it can be a really high quality product that you'll be proud to give to employers as a writing sample. And and take it even beyond that. I mean, this advice would will also prove to be beneficial in practice. I mean, to the degree that your schedules will allow, allow you um, to really work on your writing um, when when students are actually in practice, it, it, it doesn't get easier. <laughs> no, it doesn't get easier. In fact, you end up with less time. So if you talk with, with second or third year students, they'll say, oh my gosh, I thought we had so little time for the appellate brief, but now that I'm working at a firm, I realize what a luxury we had as first years. So Weeks and weeks. <laughs> weeks and weeks. So take the time now to develop the kind of habits that are going to do you right as an attorney get started early. Well, thank you, Professor, for joining me today. I, I certainly have appreciated your time and your advice and your insight. Um, I feel confident uh, that our 1Ls also will appreciate the time that they've spent listening to this podcast. Um, I thank my 1Ls for, turning, or for tuning in, and I believe that you all have some important ideas to consider now when drafting this part of your briefs. I wish you luck in writing this semester, and I look forward to you joining me for the next episode of the Widener Wordsmith podcast series. This podcast series was made possible by a generous grant award from the Association of Legal Writing Directors and the collaborative and creative support of the Legal Methods faculty at Widener University Commonwealth Law School. Widener University Commonwealth Law School is the Pennsylvania capital's only law school with three specialized centers of legal scholarship through its Law and Government Institute, Environmental Law and Sustainability Center, and Business Advising Program. Widener Law Commonwealth offers an exceptional learning experience that is personal, practical, and professional. Visit commonwealthlaw.widener.edu for more information.